boats? I mean, we need to put icons on this. We'll just keep that up and in the meantime, please tell me, are these guys rich, uh, you know, high-end Russians who are trying to overthrow him or trying to tell him you've got to capitulate in Ukraine? Or why is this happening? I don't even know what I'm Actually, I wish they were trying to tell them to get out of Ukraine. I think it's something simpler. Uh, Russia's elite has a bunch of different clans. You have the KGB successors. You have rich businessmen. You have corrupt people of other kinds. And Putin was able to keep them separated and to be kind of the intermediary. He's now losing control and losing power. And the rats are devouring each other. It's just so bizarre to, to see all that. Just It's just... I mean, honestly, there's just a wealth of knowledge for Tom Clancy here if uh, if he wants it. Um, I hope we're all going to be here tomorrow, Jonathan, so we can talk about this again. But I hope you're also right that he's just saber rattling at this point and not, you know, moving the, the big giant missiles to, you know, towards New York. Thanks for doing that. Next time I'll teach you protest words in Russia. Don't do that yet. It's a little bit How's that? That's pretty good.
There have been numerous reported cases of exposed personnel developing cancer and other serious health conditions. It is critical to take action and call Camp Lejeune victims now. If you or someone you know spent time at Camp Lejeune before 1988 and you developed any of these cancers or injuries, call to determine your eligibility for financial compensation now. If you don't win, you pay nothing. Call 800-648-0162. That's 800-648-0162. Yeah. 
her real prank. Not only did she fulfill her campaign promise, she gave up running for governor of New York to do it. After a three-year investigation, she brought civil, not criminal charges, that's curious, against former President Trump, Don Jr., Eric Trump, and Ivanka, alleging a massive fraud. She wants to bar the Trump from serving as executive of any company operating in New York. It's evidence, 280 plus agents. She points to a pattern of behavior between 2011 and 2015, where Trump and his employees wildly overvalued their assets on disclosure forms, and then would change their valuation methods as it suited them. For example, Trump's own triplex apartment in New York's Trump Tower, it was valued to be 30,000 square feet when it was actually 11,000, meaning in 2015 the apartment was valued at $227 million, $30,000 a square foot. At the time, only one apartment in New York City had ever sold for anything close to that high a price, $100 million. And in the decades old Trump Tower, the record sale was only $16.5 million. There are a lot of examples of Mr. Trump doing this, but James said Trump valued his club in Florida, Mar-a-Lago, as a possible real estate development, except he had signed away development rights a long time ago. Club generated annual revenues of less than $25 million. It should have been valued at more than, valued at about $75 million. However, Mar-a-Lago is valued as high as $739 million. And, and let's be honest, this sounds like Donald Trump. Nobody believes that Trump didn't do these things. It certainly sounds like it. At a different time of life, I knew some of his bankers. They would laugh about his disclosure forms and how blatantly inflated they were. Here's one deposition from 2007 lawsuit. Trump sued New York Times reporter Timothy O'Brien. O'Brien wrote a book, Trump Nation, The Art of Being with Donald, alleging that Trump wasn't nearly as rich as Trump claimed. That might work on an episode of The Apprentice, where President Trump said that his net worth depended on, quote, how he felt at a given time. But it does not work on official tax documents when the attorney general of New York is out to get you. The last few words of most of them, out to get you. Our justice system wasn't created to get you. I'm trying to think of the phrase that I've heard lately. The rule of law. You've heard about it a lot lately, too. But it's what makes us different than, say, Russia, where the state rules with an iron fist and officials can go get you, as best described by Robert Burry, very long time, the most irritating in Russia, the head of the secret police under Stalin, who famously said, show me the name, and I'll show you the crime. Various quotes sound an awful lot like what he and James during the first campaign. Avoid it, he 
could say I'm worth six million dollars. Now, the problem is that the Attorney General has a point, which is if you use this as a way to get people to lend you money, fraud money, fraud on false pretenses, you're committing fraud. But when you have to ask yourself, what way do you just take the man's word for it? reputation and it will, I guarantee you, have zero effect on his base. Yeah, well, you also have to just think of the contrapositive of what happens when all of a sudden uh, you've got a Republican running on investigating Hunter Biden or putting Hunter Biden in jail for his, his business dealing, just like going after Don Jr. Uh, and Ivanka. George, it's good to see you as always. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Yes, sir. I am disqualified for service for obesity, addiction, conduct, test scores, medical and behavioral health conditions. In short, too many Americans are too fat to serve as one of many. The Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines can't recruit enough people. Only 22% or 17 of 17 to 24 year olds are qualified to serve. Less than a quarter of Americans can sign up for the military. And there is an irony. Much of America is too fat to serve, but once in the military, they get paid so little, they can't feed their families. We did this story last week, twice as a matter of fact. When the sergeant major of the Army told soldiers unable to feed their families to go on food stamps, it's not his fault, he was trying to help the soldiers. It's not surprising that so many starting salaries hover below the $20,000 range. Sergeants with eight years in easily have a family of four, making it $40,000. Right now, 22,000 plus active duty troops are on food stamps. Many more, like the qualified with military culture, often means they don't ask for help. It's sad. Shameful. So imagine your soldiers stationed far away from family and home, worried about them having enough to eat. Then you hear this from the commander in chief of the UN today. And as I pledge to all of you, the United States will donate. Forward now six months uh, into this war, 
the Russians have lost now 10% of the area of the East that they hope uh, to contain uh, and begin to cut off. Right now, the Russians have called up 300,000 of their reserve troops. Uh, the war here is so unpopular that trying to get by a plane to get out of Russia is now impossible. It shows just how unpopular the war here in Ukraine is and how worried Russians are about going to fight in Ukraine. This President Biden today. This war is about extinguishing Ukraine's right to exist as a state. That should make your blood run cold. David Asher's here of the Hudson Institute. Uh, what is this? Putin's just worried he's not relevant during the UN General Assembly? What is it? I think it's something more serious. I mean, uh, Putin is losing, and uh, Russian elites are losing Putin uh, as a as a, a leader they can trust nationally. Um, some of them are really, really ultra right. They think he needs to move far much harder. That's why he's threatening a nuclear, uh, 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 a famed release nuclear attack that risks against the United States and Europe. But I also think that Putin is in, is in trouble uh, uh, because the Russians don't like losers, and he's a loser right now. When you say they don't like trouble, you mean uh, and they don't like losing. You're saying that there's a chance of a coup, but I'm trying to figure out where you're, where you're I going. Think it, I think that's not that likely right now, but I think that there's a chance that there's going to be some sort of move uh, over the next uh, coming months against them. If he surrenders as much territory at the rate of surrendering right now, the only thing he really has going for him is the weather. You know, it starts to get uh, cold and uh, mushy in the uh, in the ground uh, in mid October, uh, typically in Ukraine and north, where he's uh, losing the most ground. Um, but you know, I think with the more advanced equipment that they've been giving the Ukrainians, they're going to keep fighting. They're not going to stop in the winter time. So he's he's in trouble. But let's face it, uh, he, he, this is the first time I think in history that a Soviet or Russian leader or any leader on the crazy North Koreans has ever threatened the United States and Europe with a potential nuclear attack. It's well, not like that. Back in the day, when you know, the 50s and 60s, it was when things were back and forth, and the Russians said, you know, the nuclear was in Cuba. You know what? But what I mean, what he said, though, um, if, the ter- if the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, we without question use all means at our disposal. That, that's not really threatening a unilateral first strike on Washington. It's not, I know, the problem is anybody, I worked in the ground and around around nuclear doctrine, and this is weapon systems for years, and anytime someone who makes a failed threat uh, against the United States like this, you have to take it seriously and probably elevate a level of uh, alert. Um, and I, I've talked to a whole bunch of uh, Russia experts, including the, the Russians uh, who were against Putin, and they certainly feel that this was a different level of rhetoric and threat than they've ever seen. Russian leader historically. What do we make of that? Is it, is it the escalate to de escalate, the bolt the bluff that Putin is famous for, of, of trying to get the world to be scared? And if so, sort of the, the hand wringing in the West over this, oh my God, not a real threat. Um, I, I'm wondering if, if a sort of a calm well, you know, that's what he's going to do. What we're going to do, we're gonna do response, we're be back. I, I agree with you. And I, I also say that, um, you know, Look, Vladimir, don't think that we don't have nuclear weapons and other capabilities, and we do have a lot of other capabilities, which I can't talk about, but American people should know that we haven't spent the last 40 years since the stealth fighters were inside doing nothing with our military capability development. So, you know, we couldn't have an awful lot that we can throw at him if he ever decides to uh, make a more credible direct threat. Um, I, I, I don't think that we should uh, over uh, respond. I agree with you. I think we just need to show tangibly that we're going to keep supporting the Ukrainians. I would give them longer range rockets that can get 200 miles into Russian territory. That, I think, even though they do just hope the Ukrainians will use them at that level, having them out there, I think, would also uh, cause Putin to take pause. And the, the flip side of this is what Putin threatened, right? If the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, that speaks directly uh, to those missiles. David, thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, tonight, I'm standing with live one of the president's top national security advisors at Kirby, joins Dan Trump at News at 9 in Central, just after 5 on News Nation. Soon, two Americans die every day in drunk driving crashes. That's one person every 45 minutes. Far more who die in the street or nationally or any other event, politicians and certain cable news networks 
used to demand common sense. But the most significant piece of it about this legislation in nearly 30 years, if we can even save one life, one life, and this will save many more, it will be well worth it. So many of my good friends and colleagues on the Republican side will step forward and looking at the most reasonable path to do something. As we said, a lot more people died from drunk driving crashes, yet you never hear about common sense alcohol reform until now. National Transportation Safety Board was every part of America to come an alcohol detector. Three years for the policies to be written, two years for auto manufacturers to comply. Not for drivers, but everybody who has some test before turning on their car. Maybe not going to change it here, but maybe a fingerprint test. That's big. But remember, driving is a constitutional right, so maybe it's not that big as taking away guns. How many lives that would say? But zero. I mean, zero people who diapers are demanding. Ian Samuels here, former law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Anthony Scalia and resident on balance scholar. Uh, legal to do this, Ian? Yeah, I think it's, it's legal, um, you know, because the uh, device would be implemented in the car. Uh, the government presumably would not get access to the data, and after all, the idea would be to stop you from doing something that would constitute a crime. It wouldn't constitute the Fourth Amendment search. It would be something like a safety feature that was implemented in cars during the Obama administration, which is backup cameras, right? Some people don't know that the reason you see those everywhere, every car you rent, et cetera, has one, is because you have to, because it's easier to see a little kid behind your car with a backup camera, and it can save the lives of little kids. This is something like that. The agency that's proposing it doesn't actually have the authority to implement it as a rule. They make recommendations to other federal agencies, uh, but they want this. And, they, and this agency wants other safety features, too. They want to use cars inside the camera, cameras inside the cars, sort of notice drowsiness. They want, I think, what they call intelligent speed limitations, a.k.a. cars that, you know, basically won't go too much over the speed limit, um, stuff like that. They have all sorts of ideas for the use of technology to restrict the way that you can drive to stop you from driving in unsafe ways. And obviously that's... Um, it's going to be controversial, but they have lots of ideas like this. You say it's going to be controversial, uh, but I, I can't help but think there's this inherent difference between limiting guns, which are explicitly talked about uh, in the Constitution, and while cars didn't exist, there, there's no uh, Ninth Amendment that talks about uh, thou shalt not restrict my horse and buggy. That, that's true that there's not, and, and I think that the reason it's going to be controversial is not because uh, there's a constitutional issue with it, I don't think that there is, uh, but because the, the dark truth of the matter is that an awful lot of people drive drunk when they're not supposed to. Now that's not a good reason not to implement the policy. Actually, it's a good reason to implement right, the policy. Yeah. But it's, but it's, great, it's a great policy. Look, if you, you don't drive drunk, what do you care? Uh, it's no different than you have to have a key or anything else. It's just when you turn on your car, it doesn't send the information off to anybody. There you go. Real quick, why don't you think that people are so concerned with gun violence haven't demanded this soon? It seems like the perfect way to save lives. Well, you know, the analogy between guns and alcohol is actually a really good one because the truth of the matter is people always like to say, hey, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. But the same thing is true about alcohol. And the reality is that uh, the United States alcohol policy uh, does get a lot of alcohol into the hands of a lot of people, uh, many of whom have chronic alcohol abuse problems through no fault of their own. Uh, and there is a lot of room for reform in the way that we regulate and sell alcohol and that, you know, the things like this. Um, they're commensurate with that uh, in the United States, but the reason they don't want to do it is very simple. Rich people drink wine, right? And the rich constituents of the and Nancy Pelosi, I love them, uh, they don't mostly have guns. Uh, but rich people like to get drunk, and that means that when they have control of things, they're going to make sure that if they're going to get a little tipsy on the thing, they're going to run back to their beach house and no one's going to mess with them. That's the truth. I appreciate you saying Mark and Junior and not getting up there. Uh, Ian, it's good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. All right, another day, another record number of illegal border crossings. Why should we be more worried about the people who aren't cars are caught? And that's the statistics. The sheriff investigating for the other law changes to the list. Will he charge the governor with a crime for a blind violence? He wants to figure it out. Just because of how angry and vicious it is. It magnifies.
by the madness bringing to light what is being given more. You will watch this show and see that the job is done in the right way. Don't play the game. We changed it. It's easy to think that all money managers are pretty much the same, but a fish for investments are really different. Different how? You sell high commission investment products, right? Nope. Fisher avoids them. Well, you must earn commissions on trades. Never at Fisher Investments. Okay, then you probably sneak in some hidden and layered fees. No. We structure our fees so we do better and clients do better. That might be why most of our clients are from other money managers. At Fisher Investments, we're clearly different. When moderate to severe ulcerative colitis persists, put it in check with Rinvuk, a once daily pill. When you see that unpredictable, I got rapid symptom relief with Rinvuk. Check. When you see how me back, I got last in steroid free remission with Rinvuk. Check. And when you see got the upper hand, Rinvuk helped physically repair the colon lining. Check. Rapid symptom relief. Last in steroid free remission and a chance to physically repair the colon lining. Check, check, and check. Rinvoke can lower your ability to fight infections, including TB. Serious infections and blood clots, some fatal. Cancers, including lymphoma and skin cancer. Death, heart attack, stroke, and tears in the stomach or intestines occur. People 50 and older with at least one heart disease risk factor have higher risks. Don't take if allergic to Rinvoke, as serious reactions can occur. Tell your doctor if you are or may become pregnant. Put UC in check and keep it there with Rinvoke. Ask your gastroenterologist about Rinvoke and learn how apt could help you save. With fibroid eye disease, I was always wearing sunglasses to hide my bulging eyes. I wore them just about everywhere. But then, my doctor recommended Tepeza, a prescription medicine for fibroid eye disease, and I didn't have to hide so much. In a clinical study, more than 8 out of 10 patients taking Tepeza had less eye bulging, and nearly 7 out of 10 saw improvements in double vision. Tepeza is an infused medicine. Patients taking Tepeza may experience infusion reactions. Tell your doctor right away if you have symptoms such as high blood pressure, fast heartbeat, shortness of breath, or muscle pain. Before receiving Tepeza, tell your doctor if you have diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, or are pregnant or planning to become pregnant. Tepeza may raise your blood sugar even if you do not have diabetes and may worsen IBD such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. I look more like my old self again. Now I wear sunglasses because I want to. Ask your doctor if Tepeza is right for you and visit mytepeza.com to see Jeannie's before and after photos. I just switched to Verizon Business Unlimited. It is just right for my little business. We switched who? Unlimited premium data, unlimited hot spot data, my point of sale is all going. Switch to Verizon Business Unlimited today from the network America relies on. With Mucinex all in one. You've got unbeatable relief from your worst cold and flu symptoms. So when you need to show your cold who's boss, grab Mucinex All-in-One and get back to your rhythm. Feel the power.
get hit the Halloween?
Did we ever do that? Which is exactly what we're supposed to do based on the Presidential Records Act. And so we were doing that. And we continued to do it. And then we got hit by, we got, it was a great was so, so voluminous, the number of, you know, papers. Well, it was actually, you know, actually the pictures of it. Yeah. Pretty much, I think many pictures of people, I think they were GSA, mostly people, some people in the White House, standing outside of the White House. Other people were coming up and taking pictures. If we wanted to do this, we'd do it through the basement, and we wouldn't let anybody take pictures. We would have nothing to hide. Did I ever any point deny any access from anyone at the National from NARA or from the DOJ or the FBI access? Because in June, there were, my understanding is, the DOJ, the, the FBI guys were here, and they saw a remaining 10 boxes, which they ended up taking away. And a couple of days later, they asked you and your team to put a padlock on it. And that day, were they free to take those documents with them? Was there any disagreement about that? You said access. I'm not sure they asked for access, per se. I, I was shown the boxes. I thought we were having a very good conversation, even when they went downstairs, the attorneys went downstairs, showed them the room, showed them the boxes. I thought it was a very routine thing. And again, if you look at the law or the act or whatever the presidential records act, it basically said everything that we were doing, we should be doing. We can talk to them. Now, when they're here, we can do lots of things. We, I think we had good security. We had, as you know, we had tremendous secret service. They are unbelievable people. And they're all over Mar-a-Lago, as happens to a former president, et cetera, et cetera. I hate to use the word former because I have a lot of problems with what happened. But the fact is that we wouldn't be having all these problems that we have right now, by the way, with Ukraine and Russia talking about nuclear weapons now. And all of that because what's happening in the world is horrible. But uh, we had good discussions as per the whole Records Act, Presidential Records Act. And then all of a sudden, we were surprised. I was very surprised. By the way, if we don't have good discussions, if we can't agree with that, there's like a process that you go through. And I think that the president predominates in the end. Mm -hmm. It's his choice in the end. Let me stop here. I started this, this show with a monologue. Yeah. In that monologue, I pointed out Hillary Clinton, which is, the, I guess, the closest case in modern history that this mirrors your case, except hers were electronic. And you heard Jim Comey, I just played it, you know, top secret classified information on our server, you know, all these email chains. Then we have the deleted emails, the leech bit of the other 33,000 emails, mm -hmm. um, the hammers, the devices, the SIM cards, all those things that I mentioned. Right. So we have a similar case, and then you heard James Comey say, no prosecutor would ever prosecute. But they're threatening to prosecute you. What is the difference between what you're describing with having, they found apparently 101 uh, top, uh, classified documents in the boxes that they found. They found 11,000 pages that weren't classified. That you we don't know what they found. Because they wouldn't let any representative, they had our lawyers, it was 100 degrees out, they had our lawyers standing outside, not even allowing them into a building with that air conditioning. It's a big complex. And you had a hundred, you had a lot of people here, I don't know how many, you had a lot of people. They wouldn't let anyone inside. And you know, if you look at NARA, and if you look at the FBI over the last 10, 15 years, and if you look at all of the things at the Justice Department, what's taken place, when you look at what took place with the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, Sean, they spied on my campaign. What could be this? Could you imagine, take Obama, if he spied on his campaign? It would probably be death sentence. They spied on my campaign even when I was in the White House. And who would think that this is possible? But they spied. So, you know, we're not dealing with a lot of trust here. And the public isn't either. The American public is really angry. So then uh, this is a big part of what I want to get into. And that is, okay, I mentioned, for example, 33,000 deleted emails. We talked about Hunter Biden's laptop. We talked about in that laptop, Joe Biden is implicated many times by his own son. Uh, he, did, he didn't want to pay all of dad's bills. I didn't want to pay for his repairs. The big guy gets his cut. Tony Bobulinski confirmed the big guy is Joe Biden. He met with, we now know, about 14 of the foreign business partners, which means he lied during the campaign. Uh, you don't see anything happen there. The three- Nothing, nothing's going to happen there. I don't think the world is going to be at equal justice. And it's very unfair. It's a very unfair situation. And you mentioned
mention the word prosecute. I don't think prosecute. I don't think this is prosecutable. Under the Presidential Records Act, there's no retribution or prosecution. You're supposed to negotiate. We're talking about documents. We're talking about documents that actually are being watched over to a certain extent, and I would say to a large extent by the Secret Service, if you think about it. But I can't imagine the word, you mentioned the word prosecution. I don't hear the word prosecution. No, I'm saying they didn't prosecute them. No, no, but I don't see how they could prosecute me. How do you prosecute somebody if they didn't raid their home? No, they raided this home. They certainly didn't raid their homes. They certainly didn't raid their homes. And when Hillary broke them up, broke up all their phones with the hammers, and they did the boost, they all the things that happened were terrible. But you could also say more than three million documents or pages with President Obama. That's very questionable. 33 million, not 33,000. It happens to be a similar number. 33 million. They're fighting over them. They're arguing over them. The problem that you have is they go into rooms. They won't let anybody near them. They wouldn't even let them in the same building. Did they drop anything into those files? Or did they do it later? There's no chain of custody here with them. Would that be on videotape, potentially? No, I don't think so. I mean, they were in a room. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Because I think this is the next logical question. If the President of the United States, you, unlike, say, Hillary Clinton in her case, a President has the power to declassify. Right. Okay. You have said on Truth Social a number of times you did declassify. I did declassify. Okay. Is there a process? What was your process to declassify? There doesn't have to be a process, as I understand it. You know, there's different people say different things. But as I understand it, there doesn't have to be. You're the President of the United States. You can declassify just by saying, I'm going to get you declassified, even by thinking about it. Because you're sending it to our lobby or to wherever you're sending it. And there doesn't have to be a process. There can be a process, but there doesn't have to be. You're the President. You make that decision. So when you send it, it's declassified. We, I declassified everything. Now, I declassified things, and we've had a lot of problems with NARA. You know, NARA is a radical left group of people running that thing. And when you send documents over there, I would say there's a very good chance a lot of those documents will never be seen again. There's also a lot of speculation because of what they did to Severi of the FBI coming and raiding Mar-a-Lago. Were they looking for the Hillary Clinton emails that were deleted, but they are around someplace? Were they looking for the spies? No, no, they may be saying they may have thought that it was in there. And a lot of people said the only thing that would give the kind of severity that they showed by actually coming in and raiding with many, many people is the Hillary Clinton, you know, the Russia, Russia, Russia stuff. Or, I mean, there are a number of things. The spying on Trump's campaign. So they spied on my campaign. So why did they come in and do that? Especially since we were having such great conversations. All right, so let me go. You mentioned Russia a number of times. Let's talk about that. Andrew McKay, deputy FBI director, famously said, without Hillary's bought and paid for dossier. Now remember, she used her money and he had seen money. She funneled it to a law firm. Law firm hires Fusion GPS, an op research firm. It was in 2016. They then hired Christopher Steele, former MI6. Christopher Steele's main source is a guy by the name of Dan Shinko. He's now on trial for lying to the FBI. We know, and we've been able to confirm and report it, widely believed, first of all, the media knew all about it wrong on the Russia issue. My show got it right. Well, the surprises should be returned. I'll tell you. They are 100% wrong. They got it wrong. They got it wrong. And this is important. This dragged this country through hell for three years. And I don't do it with an ensemble cast. I think you were watching some of the coverage. So my next question is, if, in fact, they couldn't get the FISA warrant, according to Andrew McKay, without Hillary's dossier, they ruined Carter Page's life, and then because of his connection to you, that was a backdoor to your campaign, your transition team, and your presidency. Here's my question. Dan Shinko was the source for Christopher Steele. He told the FBI in January of 2017 that, in fact, it was all total BS, bar talk, not true, none of it. And a few months later, he's on the FBI's payroll. And yet they used his words as the source to spy on you as a president and candidate. He was on the payroll, and another very high up in the FBI was working with the Mueller campaign. Think of this, with the Mueller 
witch hunt, another one of the witch hunts. At least, I tell you what, we've shown the people of this country there is such corruption, whether it be elections, whether it be open borders, whether it be the kind of things we're talking about right now, the corruption is unbelievable. They have a high man in the FBI, and I think they just walked him out of the building a couple of weeks ago, right, when they found him. That they were paying. He was in charge, I'm thinking of this, he was in charge of, for Mueller, for the Mueller group of 18 radical left Democrat haters who said no collusion, there was no collusion after two years, but he was in charge, he worked for the FBI. They walked him out of the building. They walked him out. They got rid of him. What is that going to do? So when somebody says, like, uh, you're not very trusting of the FBI, there have to be changes, nature, because our country is sick. Our country has so many problems right now. Our country is sick. We, we, we 